Good morning, everybody. This is Jack Walashen from the St. James Church in Colorado Springs. Been pastoring here with Ted Haggard for low 10 years or so. It's been absolutely delightful. It's a beautiful morning here, and I hope that's good for you too. All right, today we're gonna uh, we're a few days behind on the uh, I'm a few days behind on the um, uh, highlights book. But what happened was I got stuck on this. I think this was may maybe Wednesday's um, uh, reading. And so um, I've been stuck on this for these few days. And so we're going to, that's what we're talking about today. And so we're going to try to squeeze in some kind of a meaningful message here in the next 15 minutes. Let's get right into it. First Samuel chapter 15, beginning at verse one. One day Samuel said to Saul, it was the Lord who told me to anoint you king of his people, Israel. Now listen to this message from the Lord. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I have decided to settle accounts with the nation of Amalek for opposing Israel when they came from Egypt. Now go and completely destroy the entire Amalekite nation, men, women, children, babies, cattle, sheep, goats, camels, and donkeys. Basically, this happened about 100 years after the um, after they went across the Red Sea and the Malachites were bad to the Israelites, and God hadn't forgotten, so he's going to settle accounts. So in verse 4, so Saul mobilized his army at Telim. There were about 200,000 soldiers from Israel and about 10,000 men from Judah. Then Saul and his army went to a town of the Amalekites and lay in wait in the valley. Saul, verse 6, Saul sent this warning to the Kenites, move away from where the Amalekites live or you will die with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up from Egypt. So the Kenites packed up and left. I think it's a big note there just to remember. If we, if we do right with God and God's people, God doesn't forget these things. So he, he really did protect this nation. Anyway, then verse 7. So then Saul slaughtered the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, east of Egypt. He captured Agag, the Amalekite king, but completely destroyed everyone else. Saul and his men spared Agag's life and kept the best of the sheep and the goats and the cattle and the fat calves and the lambs, everything, in fact, that appealed to them. They destroyed only what was worthless and of poor quality. Now, just to make this clear, um, we call that, where I live, direct disobedience. OK, so God gave him a clear, a clear direction and said, uh, do this. And sure enough, they did not. And so in my feeling is they took the authority that was given to them from God and placed it in the authority of their own personal authority and did what they thought was best. OK, just so we can make that clear, because it'll matter in a little bit. OK, now, then in verse 10, then the Lord said to Samuel, I am sorry that I ever made Saul king, for he has not been loyal to me and has refused to obey my command. Now, look, you got to think about this. God looks at me sometimes, and I'm, I think there's a, maybe a bit of questioning, but I can tell you, I, I don't, just for the point of this particular thing, I'm not trying to throw any, any other Christian under the bus. Sometimes I have shifted authority and done what I thought was right. And uh, it, it puts God in the spot where he has to decide against us, decide something about me. Anyway, Samuel was so deeply moved when he heard this, that he cried out to the Lord all night. Now, just to keep this in mind, this is just kind of a, I don't know, these kinds of things catch my attention. Hopefully it'll catch yours. Um, Samuel loved Saul. He loved God. And he went to bad. It bothered him that his that his friend or the king took a dive here. In verse 12, early the next morning, Samuel went to find Saul. And someone told him that Saul went to the town of Carmel and set up a monument to himself. Then he went to Gilgal. When Samuel finally found him, Saul greeted him cheerfully. May the Lord bless you, he said. I have carried out the Lord's command. And then in verse 14, it said, then what's all that bleeding of sheep and goats and the lowing of cattle I hear, Samuel demanded. It's true that the army spared the best of the sheep, the goats, the cattle, Saul admitted, but they were going to 
sacrifice them to the Lord your God, we have destroyed everything else. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop, quit talking. Don't try to justify yourself any longer. Listen to what the Lord told me last night. And then Saul said, what did the Lord tell you? Saul asked, and Samuel told him, although you may think little of yourself, you are, are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord has, an, has anointed you king of Israel. The Lord has, the <laughs> and the Lord sent you on a mission and told you, go and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites until they are all dead. Why haven't you obeyed the Lord? Why did you rush for the plunder and do what was evil in the Lord's sight? But Samuel, or Saul said, but I did obey the Lord, Saul insisted. I carried out the mission he gave me. I brought back King Agag, but I destroyed everyone else. Then my troops brought back the best of the sheep and the goats and the plunder and all of that to, the, to God. You know, what a joke. But anyway, in verse 22, but Samuel replied, clearly, Samuel had the word of the Lord here. What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness is as bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Okay, before we get past this, I, and I don't want to have to go back, but let me just say, when you if you go back up with me to verse 17, when, when finally Saul gets, you know, Samuel gets Saul's attention, and Saul says, okay, what did God say? In verse 17, he says, Samuel told him, although you may think little of yourself. Let me just say, if you remember when Saul was going to be anointed king and they had to go find him, remember he was hiding in the baggage. Um, so Saul thought little of himself then. And in this situation, he thought little of himself. In in way I see this is, Sometimes if we don't see who we really are in God's eyes, it opens the door for us to partially or to some degree disobey and, and leave ourselves open to be um, influenced by the others. Is that it, let, let's go on and, and see in verse 24. Then, then Saul admitted to Samuel, yes, I have sinned. I have disobeyed your instructions and the Lord's command. For I was afraid of the people and did what they commanded. But now, please forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. Okay, this situation is interesting because I can say two things. If you don't think well of yourself or, or if you don't think about yourself the way God thinks about you, what happens? It opens the door to the fear of man. And as we know, the fear of man brings a snare. And in, in his confession here, Saul admits, hey, look, I was afraid of these people. And I did what they demanded. You know, you know how stupid that is? Anyway, enough about Saul being stupid. Because, you know, if you point your finger one way, you have to point four back at you. I know this feeling of partially obeying. And I know this. I know this is a serious thing. And believe me, I've had to face it. The interesting thing here is in verse 25, after, the, after that direct confession, he says, but now, please forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. In verse 26, but Samuel replied, I will not go back with you. Since you have rejected Lord's command, he has rejected you, king of Israel. Now, this is an interesting thing because really, basically, God changed his opinion of Saul. And so Saul, as much as he wants to be Saul, the king of Israel, that ship has sailed. There was a window of time to obey and pay attention. So now God has to, like he did with us, those in the garden, he had a paradise. They went and screwed it up. And sure enough, he went and he sure took care of their shame and he gave them a new life. But it was a new life. It was different. 
And see, the situation is the same here. Now, this guy's been rejected as being the king that God intended him to be. Verse 27 says, as Samuel turned to go, Saul tried to hold him back and tore the hem of his robe. And Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to someone else, one who is better than you. And he who is the glory of Israel will not lie, nor will he change his mind. For he is not human that he should change his mind. It's very interesting. This is that other section of, you know, the other section in this chapter that we really use a lot to talk about God and how firm he is on his decisions. Um, we also know that he changed his mind about Saul already. So th- trying to navigate through through life with these kinds of verses is really a challenge, and it's a delightful experience. Anyway, in verse 30, what, then Saul pleaded again, I know I have sinned, but please at least honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel by coming back with me so I may worship your God. Verse 31, Samuel finally agreed and went back with him, and Saul worshiped the Lord. What I would like to say here is, from experience and from observation with many people that have, I've had the privilege of being involved with over the years, worshiping the Lord is where it starts. And worshiping the Lord is where it starts after you've done something stupid. Look, I don't know exactly how the Lord in heaven works all this. This story, of course, took place before Jesus Christ came and demonstrated his love on the cross. So we we are living, I am living in in a season after the cross. So we are thoroughly convinced that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the situation, the government of God is different in the old than it is in the new. But one thing is for sure, worship is where it starts. I can tell you from so much experience, when I stop, no matter where I'm at in the process of repenting or obeying, when I stop and worship, things become clearer to me. So this month in our church, we are doing a series on worship. And I thought this would be a good um, lesson for my opportunity to participate in this series that you know when you no matter where you're at no matter what you've done worshiping is where it starts there's plenty of plenty of times to worship you know we worship when things go well we worship when we're together you know we worship when we get instructions and inspiration you know we worship when we're involved in all kinds of good stuff but we don't often see worship as the answer to when things go south. And so worship reestablishes his authority. It's it's a kingdom principle that when we are with God and we know that we aren't him and he is God, that when we worship him, it aligns our lives, it aligns our kingdom living to where we better reflect him. And, you know, let's face it, it's good to feel forgiveness. It's good to feel acceptance, and it's good to have a future, even if it's not the original one that God wanted. Let me tell you something. God is quick and powerful. God has the ability to give us life and to give us a future. I don't know where you're at today, whether you need healing, whether you need restoration, no matter where you're at, but take a minute. Take a little bit of time and sit down and say, God, you are really God, and I am really not. Help me reestablish my intentions towards you and towards my fellow man. Help me represent you well. And most importantly today, help me to know who I am in you. Because only then will things work good. And so, God, with this on this occasion, I pray that you would uh, just really drive this stuff home to our hearts. Would you all bow your heads and pray with me for a second? Lord, I ask that in Jesus' name. We, no matter where we're at on our journey, that we will acknowledge you as our Lord, and we will spend some time worshiping you on this wonderful day and give you glory. Now, I bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a good week.